Hello, Great View friends. Thanks for joining us today. This uh, doing things a little bit different today, as I needed to be away from our normal environment and uh, a little bit of hospital check-in time. But uh, wanted to uh, make sure that you had access to our message for this weekend. Just as the earth and the environment around us has its seasons that sustain growth and life and productivity, so our lives in the Lord have seasons as well. These times of health and growth and productivity, but also times of decay and quiet renewal under the snow. Times when new life is just there below the surface, but we can't quite see it, and so we wait. That's why in the, in the church calendar, we draw attention to these seasons. Here we are in Lent, in the Christian calendar, preparing hearts and minds for the suffering and death of Jesus during Holy Week. Acknowledging that just as Jesus experienced this reality, so we might experience struggle and suffering as we walk with him. But we're also looking forward to renewal and new life and new insights, new growth emerging, even while we patiently wait. We've been reflecting on these Lent questions, questions that emerge from Jesus' conversation with, Jesus, with Peter. Are we aligned with merely human concerns? Do we need to repent and turn away from these concerns? Do we need to become realigned with the concerns of God? Our text this week is centered around Jesus' nighttime conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish, Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus is a Pharisee, this very influential group of Jewish believers and really community leaders. They respected the authority of the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, and they wanted to act upon them with care. They were concerned and, and they wanted to conduct their lives with holiness. Their problem was that they were so focused on fulfilling the law that they often missed the spirit of God behind the law. Often their teaching came across as condemnation of people who didn't follow their way of seeing things. Generally, the Pharisees didn't like what Jesus was saying, which is why Nicodemus came at night. Otherwise, his fellow Pharisees would condemn him. So Jesus and Nicodemus talk for a while. They talk about this born-again business, and Nicodemus just can't seem to understand what Jesus is getting at. It seems too disconnected from the law in the way that he thinks of it. Let's pick up their conversation at verse 12. Jesus says, I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, referring to himself. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, in his statement, Jesus is re referring to a story from the Torah, from the first five books of the Old Testament, that, of course, Nicodemus would know very well. It's a story that takes place after many years of wandering in the wilderness, a new generation of Hebrews who had never lived in Egypt, or at least they were too young to remember living there if they had, 
they were complaining about the hardship of the wilderness and they longed to return to Egypt. In response to their human concerns, they experience a plague of snakes that bite and poison many people in their nomadic community. But God offers a way forward from their distress. He says, Moses, lift up a pole with a bronze snake upon it, and everyone who looks upon that snake will be healed. So this is the story that Jesus is referring to when he speaks to Nicodemus. The Israelites had to look up at the bronze snake. They had to acknowledge their grumbling and their complaining. And then they would be healed. Jesus uses the story of the plague of snakes that attacked these rebellious Israelites. And the bronze snakes that God instructed Moses to erect for their healing, Jesus uses this story to describe the healing work that he had come to do. The Son of Man will be lifted up just like that, Jesus says. And those who draw close to him, who acknowledge in a sense that it's our brokenness that has placed him on the cross, those who believe that Jesus is Emmanuel, God amongst us, they will be healed. Rather than death, they will experience eternal life. Well, how is this possible? Well, because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. The, the bronze snake in the desert was offered as a solution to their self-absorbed desire to return to Egypt that desire of putting their own human concerns first. The bronze snake, in that sense, was not condemnation. They had already condemned themselves by their self-centeredness. In fact, that bronze snake that they were called to look at was an act of grace and love from God. He, he provided a solution. God so loved the world that he offered his son is the solution to our brokenness. Jesus did not come to condemn anyone. He actually came to offer a way forward. Jesus continues talking to Nicodemus here in the darkness of the evening. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Hmm. Well, what do you think, Nicodemus? Hmm. Now, we don't know if Nicodemus ever came into the light, was ever prepared to meet Jesus in the daytime. We don't get more to that story. But a, a key to understanding both of these stories of the, the snake and the wilderness and Jesus and being lifted up, the key is to understand that a response is required a willingness to admit what plagues us, so to speak. To find healing, the Israelites had to look up to the bronze snake. Just doing that was an act of repentance, of turning away from their grumbling to the God who had cared for them for decades as they traveled throughout the wilderness, those 40 years, and who now was 
literally offering them healing once again. Jesus says those who love darkness will not look up when he is lifted up. Because that looking up will require turning away from other pursuits, our human concerns. It will require admitting that we need help. In a sense, it's those who are desperate for healing who will come to the light, who will look up and find life. The big question for the world, really, is whether we will admit our need. The poison of self-interest that is destroying us. Whether it's a family murdered in their home in Ottawa. Whether it's climate change that has us waking up each morning to unnatural temperatures. Or whether it's the struggle to find affordable housing that's present amongst people in our own congregation whether it's the issues of war and displacement in Ukraine and Israel and Palestine and now Haiti as well. This is not a good world that's just getting better. Can we actually acknowledge that reality? Like the Israelites, it's easy to look at the hardships of the world and long for the good old days forgetting that those very good good old days actually brought us to where we are today. It's easy to long for what we don't have and complain that God isn't fixing everything the way we want God to do it. It's easy to complain that way. But denial of the reality is kind of a a human worldwide preoccupation. True repentance, turning away from darkness to the light, requires great courage and great humility. Nicodemus, in a sense, wasn't ready for that in his conversation with Jesus. He is not prepared to courageously admit his need for Jesus, to heal his brokenness, his self-interest. He doesn't doesn't take that path as far as we know from the scriptures. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that our world, our politicians, our social influences are ever going to repent in any substantial way. But I do believe that Jesus is reaching out to those here and there who are willing to be drawn into the light. He's calling little groups like us, our Grapeview community, to honestly acknowledge our need, to repent of our focus on human concerns to ask for transformation and commit to walking with him, bringing healing, justice, love to those we encounter in our daily lives, living out the things that are of concern to God. Denial is a destructive thing. When we fail to acknowledge our brokenness and apologize, ask for forgiveness when we hurt others, when relationships break down, when our marriages break down. It's because we're denying our responsibility. When we refuse to take responsibility for our own health, our own habits of eating and exercise, our bodies break down. When we refuse to look at our finances honestly and admit our tendency to spend what we don't have, our peace of mind and our economic well-being breaks down. When we refuse to look at our beliefs and recognize when we fall into self-righteousness and legalism and exclusion and judgmentalism that in fact our witness for Christ 
breaks down. In every family and community, the pain of denial can be identified, recognized. But so can the healing and the freedom that comes from honest repentance, truly taking responsibility and committing to changed habits and doing acts of mercy and care for those in need. Every follower of Christ, each one of us, has a daily choice to live in the darkness of denial or in the light of repentance. We can choose to know the salvation of God's healing and restoration, or we can stay in the poisoned wilderness of our own fear and pride and self-centeredness. Each week during Lent in our Evensong devotional time on Wednesdays, we pray these prayers. They're a reminder to us as we gather. Perhaps you can join together with me in these prayers of confession and that Christians have prayed for centuries. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O oh Lord, show mercy toward us miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared unto all humanity in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for Jesus' sake, that we may hereafter live in godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. So in this season of Lent, we pray that we all might be given the grace and the strength to repent and grow closer to you, O God. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. The story of the bronze serpent in the wilderness and it serves as a, a foreshadowing of God's mission of love through Jesus when our battered Savior is going to be lifted up on Good Friday. Just a few weeks we will remember and reflect upon that. Yet for love, in a sense, to be fully realized, it requires a response. The appropriate response to God's love is faith, I believe. Jesus calls on us to believe. And the psalmist reminds us that faith is often the action of knowing from whom we should ask for help. In the way that the Israelites cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress, which was our psalm reading this morning. So friends, as you walk with the Lord this day, this week, may this kind of humble acknowledgement of our need for a God who heals and restores and renews us, as we look up to him acknowledging our challenge of ever matching what he's asking of us, we express our dependence and that knowing who to call out to is that first step. So this week, friends, as you walk with the Lord, let's take this time to call out to the one who heals us, that we might be renewed day by day. Lord be with you, friends. Take care.